Mochica in the north, and the Nazca in the south. Following this, the Tiwanaku civilization sprang up in the high plateau of Bolivia and overflowed like water down the mountainside. Again, local states grew out of the declining widespread empire, including the Chimuca and Ica culture. About 1100 AD, a group of Indians who called themselves Incas seized control of the fertile Cusco Valley. Their genius lay in military and political organization. By persuasion and by conquest, their armies conquered the regions to the south and west and north until the Inca Empire extended some 2,500 miles along the Pacific and included the modern countries of Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, as well as large parts of Chile and Argentina. This was but a short time before the armies of Spain in 1532 conquered the Andes region. But the once great Inca civilization has not been forgotten. Perched on a narrow ridge 2,000 feet above the sacred Urubamba River, covered by heavy underbrush, the Inca city of Machu Picchu, city of the old mountain, rested undisturbed until the expedition of Dr. Hiram Bingham cleared away its protective forest cover in 1911. It is one of the best preserved of Inca cities and presents a picture of the life of the past. The houses were built on the high ridge, not only for protection, but also because the sloping sides were needed for agricultural terraces. A long zigzag trail leads up to the city from the river below. The main entrance is through a narrow gateway of well-dressed stones. On each side of the doorway, stone pegs are found, and a stone ring was cut out of a massive lintel so that a wooden doorway could be lashed in place in times of siege. Throughout, the city is a maze of streets and houses arranged in segregated units. Some houses are built of carefully cut and polished stones. Others have rough stone walls. Most of the houses have gabled ends, and some are of two stories. Projecting pegs in the side walls were used for fastening on the roofing beams, since the roofs themselves were made of poles and thatch. The doors were probably made of bamboo reeds. Inside the houses, niches were built in the walls, both for decoration and for storage. Most of the rooms are small, and were occupied by single families. Since nights are cold at these high altitudes, the houses had as few openings as possible. However, one building at Machu Picchu has three stone-lined windows and may well have served as a well rather than a dwelling. The dressing and fitting of the hard granite blocks which line these windows is one of the outstanding achievements of Inca masonry. An excellent illustration of dressed stone masonry is this rare semicircular tower. Inca masons had no tools of iron or steel, although they did know how to smelt and cast copper and bronze. However, the secret of the smooth stone walls is one of hours and days of patient chipping with hammer stones and grinding with sand and water. Thousands of water-worn boulders which served as hammers have been found at these ruins. The stones were dressed and fitted at the spot, and the work was so well done that no cement or mortar was needed to hold them in position. Some of the buildings at Machu Picchu are of open construction and employ large stones. These massive stones were moved and shaped and raised to their positions, although the Incas knew nothing of wheels or pulleys or jacks. All was done with stout ropes, inclines, crude log levers, and above all, superb organization of labor. In the Inca system, every able-bodied man among the common people was a worker. Taxes were paid in labor. Some paid taxes by building these special houses of the priests and aristocrats. 
Others cultivated the fields of the church and the state. Such a system required that exact records be kept by specialists of the number of work units performed by every commoner, whether in maintenance of the public streets and highways or in the fields or in the never-ending task of keeping the vital water supply system in working order. Since the Incas knew nothing about writing, the accounts were kept in a decimal system on a knotted string device called a quipu. The Incas also lacked a recorded calendar. The simple sundials were cut out of large blocks for calculating the hours of the day and the days of the year. Such specialized knowledge as mathematics and astronomy was limited to the priests and the Inca aristocracy. The commoners furnished the manpower and received protection and economic security in return. The Incas maintained an intricate system of roads throughout the empire, and sections of these are still in use today. In rough terrain, the road beds were paved with flat slabs, or steps were cut out of the bedrock. The roads were built in as direct a line as possible, since steep grades were no handicap to foot travelers and transportation on llama. soils of semi-tropical mountain valleys like this one of Ollantaytambo, the crops were planted. Tillable land was divided into three parts, one for the support of the government, one for the support of the official religion, and one, incidentally the largest, for the support of the commoners. The Incas were good farmers. They knew irrigation and fertilizers and crop rotation. They also knew that soils wash away in the rain. So they built up terraces, one above the other, faced them with rough stones, and packed new soil behind. Pathways cut through the fields, and if the terrace was high, projecting stones were left as crude stairways. Corn and potatoes were the basic crops, supplemented by beans and squash. Plowing and planting were both done with a simple digging stick before the Spaniards brought the plow and oxen. Preservation of food was always important. The Incas brewed a mild corn beer called chicha, which was semi-sacred and restricted in use to religious celebrations. In some places, zigzag grooves are cut in the rocks and may have been used for serving the corn beer on ceremonial occasions. Some of the ruins found today were undoubtedly religious centers. At this site of Kenko, not far from Cusco, rows of seats are arranged in the form of an amphitheater. In the center is a large, weather-worn, upright stone and a paved altar. Here, llamas were once sacrificed and other offerings were placed. Nearby is the entrance to a subterranean chamber which also contains an altar. Religious ruins such as these and the traditional accounts both suggest a well-organized priesthood. Other buildings are identified as palaces of the important Inca rulers. This site of Colcampata is located in the hills above Cusco. The terraces are of well-dressed and rough stones. Again, the rare feature of a window is seen in one of the walls. However, decorative niches resembling false doorways are common. Some have suggested that sentries might have been stationed in these niches since the Incas were constantly engaged in warfare. Fortresses guard many Inca towns. In the valley of Ollantaytambo, the fort is located on a jutting promontory overlooking the modern town. 
The naturally steep sides of the ridge were reinforced with carefully built stone walls. These fortresses served both for protection against outside enemies and for controlling newly conquered peoples. When a village continued to be rebellious, it might be moved in its entirety to another region, or a village of loyal citizens might be moved into the rebellious area to serve as a garrison. Olyan Taitambo, according to tradition, stubbornly resisted the Inca invasion and might well have been pacified in this manner. The fort is an excellent example of Inca masonry, and aside from the protective features, it is decorated with well-made niches. Some of the stonework at the fortress is not of the typical Inca style, but rather of squared and smooth red sandstone blocks and slabs with cut-out notches for fitting. Such contrasts in masonry suggest that the first builders were of a different culture, in spite of the fact that the stones were reused in the Inca fortress. A lookout station was located high above so that a sentry could watch over the valley and the fortifications below. Cusco, the Inca capital, was protected by the great fortress of Sacsayhuaman, built on a high hill overlooking the town. The precipitous cliff on the town side needed little reinforcement. Along the backside, massive slabs and blocks were carefully cut and fitted into three terraces of zigzag pattern over 1,200 feet in length. Many of the stones weigh several tons each. The fort was built to resist siege and mass attack by soldiers armed with clubs, spears, slings, and bows. The corners were carefully rounded and the walls smooth to make scaling difficult. In spite of the fact that the building materials came from the immediate area, the task of cutting and placing such blocks was enormous. Drains were cut so that the rains could not undermine the foundation. On top of the fortress, houses were built for the garrison. In effect, this fortress was virtually impregnable in pre-Spanish times. Near the fort is a so-called Inca throne, but the Spaniards replaced the Inca rulers in 1532. For the Spaniards brought cannons and guns. They wore armor and fought on horseback. They fought on dark nights unlighted by the full moon, a sacrilege in Inca custom. Today, the old Inca capital of Cusco is a thriving mountain town of 50,000 inhabitants, but it still has its eight centuries of history behind it. The Quechua language of the Incas is still as common as the Spanish. Cusco is a blend of ancient Inca, colonial Spanish, and modern Peruvian. Sturdy Inca stone walls still serve as foundations for modern houses. In the 16th century, a Spanish count lived in this palace. This Jesuit church was erected after the earthquake of 1650. A modern hotel overlooks Cabildo Plaza. Some of the narrow Cusco streets, like Loreto Lane, are flanked on both sides by ancient Inca walls. The archaeologist studies the many styles of stone masonry and notes the perfection of fitting. The historian points out that this wall was once part of the Inca cloister for chosen women skilled textile weavers. Scratch almost any wall of modern Cusco and the Inca foundation is revealed. Some walls are made of large, irregularly shaped stones carefully fitted together. In this wall, one famous stone has 12 sides fitted into contact with other stones. Not even a knife blade can be inserted in the joint. Another Inca wall of irregularly shaped stones of superb workmanship is covered by a crude wall of rough stones set in clay. Not only does this represent two past civilizations, but both walls are still in use in a modern Cusco dwelling.
convent of Santo Domingo is an excellent illustration of the fusion of Inca and Spanish. The present Spanish convent is built over the foundations of the most sacred Inca temple, the Inticancha, which means literally the sun's yard. This was the holy of holies of Inca sun worship. At the back of the convent is one of the finest examples of Inca masonry, a curved wall of carefully dressed and fitted stones. The Spanish descriptions of the Inca Sun Temple are almost unbelievable. Gold and silver plate formed decorative friezes around the walls. The temple gardens displayed plants, insects, and animals, all made of the finest gold and silver. Inside the temple was a great golden disc, said to have measured 60 feet in diameter. It was so placed that its polished surface reflected the rays of the sun. The conquering Spaniards absorbed the wealth of the Incas and blended it with their own. They built their houses in the style of Spain. They introduced heavy wooden doorways and the typical wooden balconies, many of which are elaborately carved. Some have grills, which allowed the women to look out without being seen. Spanish houses of colonial style have interior courtyards with flowering gardens. Family life still centers about this patio, isolated from the noise and the bustle of the streets. The modern convent of La Merced is one of the finer examples of the colonial art. The cloister patio is lined with decorated arches and pillars typical of old world Spanish style. The doorway of a modern Cusco building was built by the Incas. The sides are decorated with snakes, and on the lintel above, a Spanish nobleman carved his coat of arms. The entrance of another Cusco dwelling was long ago decorated with four carved busts, which are popularly believed to represent the four Pizarro brothers all of whom figured in the conquest of Cusco. High above Cusco, near the fortress of Saxawaman, the modern Indian children still enjoy the natural slide made for them and their ancestors by glacial action. of Inca rule ended long ago. The colonial Spanish empire has disappeared. Still the echoes resound and the shadows are seen in the streets of modern Cusco. Spanish descendants still gather in coffee shops to discuss the bullfight. Indians still walk the streets and drive their burden-loaded llamas along familiar paths. Modern Peru is more than a living museum of the past. Out of the mixture of Spanish and Indian, out of the blend of two great cultures, a new civilization is arising. A new spirit is growing, on which, in reality, depends the future of Peru.